one. All right, peace to you, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Now, today we are at the head of the diocese in our city of the Catholic Church. Today is Sunday, and we're doing the exact same thing we were doing last time, just warning these people and communicating the truth, because that is the duty of any messenger and anybody who believes in the Word of God, to fear not the reproach of a critic and to speak the truth. So that is what we're doing here today. Praise the Lord God. Yeah, this church is filled with evil and idolatry, all kinds of icons, all kinds of describing the partnership to God. And according to the Quran, we have a responsibility not only to all of mankind, but even specifically to the people of the book. Christians and Jews, they are people of the book, and we are to call and exhort them to God alone. And that is what we're doing here today. I am I am simply calling you to worship the one true God. Do you, do you, do you believe the Bible? So the, do you know the first commandment? Do you know the first commandment? I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You're not having an intelligible conversation. Anyways, you've been warned, and now you will face God. May the Lord reveal the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important message you will hear in your life. Remember the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The first and greatest commandment to worship God alone. It's being contravened in these churches. That is the first and greatest commandment to be pure monotheists. Determined pretty early. It's very clear. It's very clear in the Bible. I am the Lord thy God. So, Thou shalt have no so other what gods before me. You call yourself? I am those who follow the scriptures of God alone and worship God alone without any associate partners. So, and when did you guys start? Oh, I started. Who founded? There's no founding. It's God who founded us. He revealed the same faith from the beginning well, to Adam, and it, and, it, what, what and it passed year, down through what history. Year did uh, did uh, your I, you haven't identified really? But I, I I am a Quran alone Muslim, so I follow the Quran oh, and I, okay, re I, re gotcha. I reject I All reject right. I reject the traditions that have come of men in the so-called Islamic religion, which is the yeah, Hadith and all those things, and I follow the Scripture alone. Islam, Islam came, came to about Adam, the, the first year man. That, that Christ died on the cross. Abraham, you, you would deny that Christ even died on the cross. Did not you? die on the cross. That's a lie. Exactly. Every historical uh, source that we have says that he did. You have four anonymous gospels. You have you have one even, book that was written six hundred years later. It was revealed by God. The Quran is revealed by God Everybody to can make take that claim. To, the, make the Quran. That the Quran was revealed by God. It's simply my duty to warn and convey the clear message, right? The Quran is revealed by God, partly among other things, to clear up the errors that people put in the previous scriptures. So this idea that Jesus is God, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, well, the Word was God, this is idolatry. There's a lot of self-contradictions in the Quran. And there's, well. there's no contradiction in the Quran at all. There are plenty of contradictions in the Bible. I have a full notebook of them in my bag. Uh -huh. um, yeah. What about the, the uh, doctrine of, um, I forget the word for it, where if one thing contradicts in the Quran, you go with the later one. That comes from, again, Islamic so-called tradition. It does not yes, come from the Qur'an. The Qur'an clearly it proclaims for itself that it contains no contradiction. Can, so this the idea Quran that there's a contradiction... So the idea that there's a contradiction in the Qur'an and one part is supposed to overrule the other, this is comes from the fake Islamic religion and nothing to do with the Qur'an itself. Then, then you hold to the nonsensical that there are no contradictions whatsoever. Absolutely, there is no contradiction. It's the final revealed were, and perfected scripture. Prepared, I would, I would have I'll, I'll tell you contradictions. I'll, I'll tell you contradictions in the Bible right now, right? I have to ask you firstly, when Jesus was supposedly, allegedly killed on the cross, what were his last words? Oh, there were five or six phrases he that are recorded. Really? Uh, between the four gospels. Because each gospel different gospels they record a different last word yeah. either it is uh my god my god why have you forsaken me let me ask you something or it can be uh it is finished let, let me ask you something if there's a father into thy hand i commend my spirit yeah, these are all means. different accounts yeah. and narratives another thing just those things that are coming on the top of my mind the contradictions in the gospel are copious it's there's not a one contradiction there, there's like you know were, were the mark, jews matthew recorded that he said something mark recorded that, that he, he said, said something, something different but that doesn't say that mark said that Ma he didn't say what matthew said he said these are all See, talking about if, the if last word, if, okay, the think last about it this words way. of Jesus. Think about it this way. The police get five or six different calls about an event that happened, okay? And they get all these police reports that come in from people who legitimately saw what happened, but they're going to have variations between them. They're not going to be word for word. They're not going to be even uh, moment for moment. 
but the same. not all of people them are can going be to perceive not reality all of them are going to be correct ways though. and record what they hear and what they see that yeah. doesn't mean they're going to remember everything perfectly verbatim and it doesn't mean that every account is going to correspond perfectly so then i have to ask which one was historically accurate what actually happened so for example let's have, say the police let's say the, the police let's say the police call and they say oh we have a man protesting outside the catholic church one person says he was wearing a blue suit another person said he was wearing a red suit another person says he was wearing jeans and a t-shirt can all of these be correct no one of them not, is historically accurate but so show I ask me which the bible one? passage that are actually contradicting each other in that way I where they're a, saying this is what happened and that is what okay happened. Yeah, i'll get it as oh. opposed to as opposed to okay. collections of quotations yeah. these are just the that ones that come on my mind each other. i have a full full notebook right here but i knew i should have brought one i got one in my phone though okay <laughs> so we can start with the fact you worship jesus as god right you call him the son of god you say he's god who died on the cross i have you know copious amounts of verses. Deuteronomy well, 6. No, no, can we stick to one topic at a time though? Yeah, find, yeah. Find the, well this is the, this is the primary verse. concern. The primary concern is the Catholic Church's contravention of the first commandment. Okay, but the you're attacking commandment. the Bible in order to say that that's the truth, right? You're, you're, you're attacking the scriptures in order to say that they're not reliable. Yeah. So well, instead yeah, of, instead not of not arguing reliable over the divinity of Christ, let's argue over the reliability of the scriptures sure, because that's certainly. what we were going with. Right. Where are the contradictions from each other? Because I know that there are Roman sources, there are Jewish sources, who all record that Christ lived and that he died on the cross under Pontius Pilate, and that his belief, that his followers believed, even even the atheist scholars who studied the Bible, all agree that his followers believed that he rose from the dead and that they saw him, and that he performed miracles and that they performed miracles. According to the Quran, it was that he was not crucified and put to death, but it was made to appear so. Yeah. So how that happened, the Lord knows best. The, I'm, I'm here. I'm give here. me the logic train for Allah to... Well, God. Yeah. God Almighty. What, what logic give, train? Give me the logic train that makes any sense if, uh, if Jesus was a legitimate prophet, that he would... that such a falsehood would be reported about him and idolatry committed his name. Well, this, this is a great test that has happened. This is a great test that has happened. God has allowed these devils to write these things, these falsehoods about Jesus. And from there, the test ensued. And God would see which one of them would worship, which one of his believers would worship him alone, and which ones would fall away into idolatry. And this idea well, that another man died for their him? sins and all those kinds of things. There were 12 men who followed him. One fell away. Paul took his place. Where, where... There, there's there's consistent writings from other sources that they all died for their belief in seeing the resurrected Christ. There's no extra biblical sources for that. What? That's been proven wrong. Well, for the existence of Jesus. outside the bible yeah outside these again these anonymous that's gospels, not even true right there's there's roman and jewish sources who record what happened right and, and, the Quran, and they the record Quran. the the growing of the christian um movement and they record the martyrdom of the apostles like do you not consider the, the crime of being being saying or saying these words to say that god the almighty and we know when we read the old testament how strong God is about honoring his name to say that God died on the cross. Mm -hmm. God was humiliated, spit on, God. mocked, killed, and put in the ground. Do you not fear God, God to be able to say those words? God does not humble, man. he is the Almighty. What, what does hum humility Because it is the ultimate example of love and humility for us. Humility and humbleness presupposes that there's one above you that yes. you humble yourself before. So the reason you and are to be humble man, and I am to be humble, and my brother in here remained above him in the, his divine form the whole Whereas reason the whole reason God why the son 
the whole, the whole came to the earth. The, the whole reason why we are to be humble is because we acknowledge we're not the greatest here. It's God Almighty who's the greatest. Yeah, but there is agree. none greater than God. That's why He exalts. That's agree. why He commands us to worship Him and to adulate Him with praises and good words and good names, all these things. Because there's clearly no, there's no way or no suggestion in the Old Testament that God humbles Himself and that God would be spit on and mocked and crucified. He is so exclusive many, that when the children of Israel, whenever many, they worshipped another name other than God, he took them out of the Holy Land, he punished them and rained woes and curses on them. Then when they returned back to God alone, God returned them back to the Holy Land. There's many right? and then rounds the Christians of that come. happened. The Jews fell away, they were punished, and they came back. Why? Because many they mourned after other gods. Yeah. Right. right. So when you worship a man, you worship three gods in here, possibly more. <coughs> God the no. Father, God the Son, God, God the Holy Spirit. One God, plus one plus one equals three. Persons of one essence, of one divine essence. That's just that's gobbledygook just nonsense. nonsense. Just because you don't understand it. That's meaningless nonsense. There's a difference between a mystery and a contradiction. A, it's mis a mystery, a mystery is... And you're, you, it's a contradiction because you don't have another example to, sh to show multiple personages within one being. Yeah, that's the that's, only example. It's a meaningless example. distinction. Be it, it's it, just it's just like it word word salad, right? Because like how can you have Jesus being God and God being God yet Jesus is praying to God in the New Testament, right? He's, he's saying, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" And you know, but what is he saying? That, myself, myself, why Muhammad have I forsaken myself? Jesus. Muhammad didn't write anything that was revealed oh, by the okay, Most High. Yes, he was illiterate. Um, he the the what he recorded about Jesus was written six hundred years after him. So am I going to take the word of the apostles who wrote within a lifetime of his life or the man, the warlord who wrote 600 years later? He is not a warlord. And talked about if you read the Quran, killing it says very clearly and, and enslaving those who well, Clearly, you are not educated. And You're trying to refute something you have not encompassed in knowledge yet. I, I, the Quran, I, I haven't studied the Quran, that's yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, so the Quran, I'm going to you know, teach you something about it right now. The Quran teaches, There is no compulsion in doctrine. Sound judgment is clear from error. It is against explicit Quranic commandments to convert people by the sword. Hey, whoa, All slow down, slow down. Sound judgment what? Sound judgment is clear from error. Okay, so That's you make a mistake says. and you adjust your, your course. Right. That's not God is saying, yeah, that we have no authority. All, all our authority is to go and warn, to You're deliver and communicate and the message. And then you start talking like really fast so that I'm I can't... I'm not talking fast. I'm conveying you to you the message very clearly, right? So I'm telling you, the Quran says our job is to warn, to tell, to call out sin and evil whenever we see it, mm -hmm. and then we leave the matter with God at that point. Right? We don't go and fight people unless they openly go and try to attack us, then we defend ourselves. But until then, it remains verbal. That's the Quranic command. And to kill somebody without the, the, them having killed another person, that's a crime, according to yeah, the Quran. Of course. Right. So this whole idea, you can even look at There is no compulsion so in religion or doctrine. So a handful or of Judeo-Christian values with its, with its values. It's not... Well, yeah, well, we it, came first, right? the, the reason it has certain Judeo-Christian it's values. Like, it's like woke it has they, certain... they, they have some values that they've salvaged from from the Judeo-Christian roots of the country, but most of it they've thrown to the wind to their own hedonistic. Right. And this is a disease. It's a disease upon society. I would, and I, I would argue the same for Islam. No, it is not. Because it is it's... calling us back to that original tradition of worshipping God alone with no associate partners. And I would say the same thing here. There is Jews some the semblance, the say there's some semblance of truth in this church, but there is deviations added in as well. The deviations of men, saying that there's a son of God, but he's also God, but he's also God's son at the same time. But there's one God, but there's three persons, and then one died on the cross. This is just insanity of the highest order. It makes no sense. Basically, the Christian argument boils down to one plus one plus one is a one, which is just a fundamental contradiction. Uh, with an immaterial object, that could be the case. No. That's just right? a theory. How many? Oh, what's that? That silly uh, quotation I heard. How many? If uh, if angels are immaterial beings, then how many could dance on the tip of a pen? It's like there is no limit. I don't believe in immaterial beings. The concept. That's what God is. The co the whole concept. Is of God a, do you think God is a tangible material? Yes. According to the Quran and the Bible, I wrote a book on this very matter. The, the earth is flat and stationary. There's a dome over the earth, and God is in the oh. highest heaven, and he watches over the earth on his throne. So now he's you're a just real, everything he's, that we know from he's, modern. He's a real, concrete, from, tangible. I can he show gave you. Us, he gave us rational minds to figure out the world around us, and you still believe in a flat earth. The Bible teaches that, my friend. The Bible it, the teaches Bible that. The Bible can be twisted into 
into thinking that. There's but no. it's written in language according to how you see things. It says the Earth is we know established that the sun so that rises every moved. day, but we know that the sun isn't rising. The, we know that the Earth is turning towards it. That is not in the Bible. According, but, but according we, to the we, Bible, but in the Bible, it's written as the sun rising. But you know what? That there, doesn't mean that they're lying in the Bible. That means that you need to interpret it correctly. Well, the verse, there's a verse in the, the Bible that says the Earth been around is, since those scriptures were written, and they are responsible for interpreting it. The Bible says the Bible says that the Earth is established so that it be not moved or it cannot move. God, very clearly in the Bible and the Quran as well. Because it follows upon that same tradition, describes the earth as fixed, stationary. I'm, I'm just asking, do you believe those verses in the Bible? Which? I'm going to show you right now if I have them on with me right now. Because about the firmament and all. Yeah, the firmament. Yes, that's descriptive language. God that's said. Descript and if it's in Genesis, that's not an argument against Catholics because we don't take Genesis literally. So you don't believe in Genesis? I believe that God created the earth. I believe that He created man, and I believe that. The, the methods in which that was recorded are allegorical language so that we could understand it. So what, what would your understanding be of the firmament in Genesis? The, the firmament is just a description of the sky. The atmosphere? Of the heavens. Right. right? The heavens means many things too. It means it could mean the, the heavens where God resides. It can mean the sky. The, that the birds are flying in? Well, both are the same. God is mean literally space, above our head. God because, is literally above our head, see, and right. He watches us, right? He's Even in, in Genesis the in, in Genesis 1, it that's says why, that... That's why we've we've launched to the moon and we haven't found it. The moon landing is a fraud from Satan. It's a lie. Nobody went to the moon. What about the Voyagers and the Space Probes that went out all the way past I, the I wrote, the I, I wrote a 1,000-page book. It's available for free online if you'd like to download it, dealing with space and the nature of the Earth and the physiology and the psychology... Not the psychology, sorry. And the physics and everything. I've dealt with this matter and it's probably the biggest lie we're told in this day and age that the earth is a globe and it's spinning through space it does not comport with the scriptures and actually you shouldn't see if we believe that we believe that the scriptures are the truth but if we if we find you just said you don't interpret genesis literally yes so you don't believe it's the truth i don't believe the, the only hey, way the, to interpret the ancients something were not literalistic like it modern literally. people are they were not completely literalistic like that. Saint, Saint Augustine in the 500s or 400s even recognized that in the Genesis account, God created the day and the night cycle on day one, and he created the sun and the moon on day four. So even back in the fourth century or fifth century or whatever it was, the, the, the great thinkers of Christianity were able to deduce that Genesis was not a literal word for word. This is how God created it. That's that was a, we foolish, knew, we that knew is a that foolish interpretation way over on their part. That's a years ago. If anyone is to believe a book in any real capacity with integrity, they're going to take it literally. On its face, the first value interpretation that you get, that's, that that's, is the right way. That's, that is that's right a way. modern way of thinking. Right? Because this whole idea of, that's oh, I'm, I'm going to interpret it allegorically, that's not the way then, it was then, then, you can, then you can interpret it any way. There's no standard for what you believe in. No, you can't, because the church tells that's us why what I'm, we can't. I'm here you, taking yes, the Bible there are many things that we can say. I think that means this, and I think it could mean that. It could mean both. They don't contradict each other. Great. You're free to believe either way. But there are other things that are dogmatically defined that say no. John 3, 5 is referring to baptism. Protestants who say it isn't are wrong. How do you know that's not allegorical? Because the church, the, the authority in which Christ gave the church is to teach in his name the truth and what? to not bind the faithful to a falsehood. Was not the whole mission of Christ in the Gospels, or a big part of his mission at least, to preach against false religion? Yeah. He was going into the synagogues, the, the established religion of his day, yeah. the priests of his day, and he was and, calling them out. That was the was whole not, tradition. No. And it, was, it wasn't this big, Jew massive Judaism church. Judaism was not it a was false not, religion. And it was not this big, Judaism, massive church. It was a small group of people. It was a small group of people butting heads with the broader society, including the established religion of that day. And that is the same tradition we're following, where a small was, group of people butting heads with the broader society follows false religions. That's exactly what Christ you did. You can make that equivalent, but that doesn't make one, both of them true. Whose structure is more like what Christ was like in the Bible? Did Christ have a big, massive religion and church when you read of him in the New Testament? Or was it a small band of people largely butting heads with the larger society around them? What was does, it like? Does God have the even the will Quran to says save this. all men? Even the Quran... Does God will to save all men? No. If he will to save all men, they would be saved. So you have almost Calvinist-like beliefs in, the, in that 
your choice is really kind of not a part of it. You just no, that's a straw, man. Man. no, no, that God, God is God has given man a choice, but if he wills, okay, so if he wills for a man to be saved, then that man will be saved. And if he wills for a man's heart to be hardened, but there are reasons why God hardens a heart. For example, in the Quran it says, God does not guide the wrongdoing people. So if I continually and perpetually in my obstinance continue in sin, then God will harden my heart and seal it off. It right. goes both ways. God has to open the heart, the but same I have thing. to earn I go to confession well. every week so that I'm in a state to be in the presence of the Lord. On the Sunday. only one we need to confess our sins to is the Lord. Nobody can forgive sin confess except for God. Confess your sins to one another. Those are his words. That's a foolish, that's a foolish word. Well, then you, you tell me that you believe Christ was a prophet and yes. all the, every word that he is recorded that he said, you, you have to deny because you deny the book. Right. I come with the Quran, which is the final revelation. And if you read the Quran, God Does says that Quran it acts... Does the Quran record any of Christ's words? It says, yeah, it records a lot of Christ's words, right? The Quran, 600 years after the fact. Yeah, however many years it was after the fact, but it was revealed by God, right? Right. So here's the thing. When God says in the Quran that... Quran also acts as a control over the previous scriptures, right? So God acknowledges and recognizes that men have put in their own words and interpretations into them. And the Quran acts as a control and guide over that. So there is, for example, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. There is certain things in the gospel that suggest that Jesus was divine. And the Quran acts as a control over that. Say not three, but one. That's what God says in the Quran. Right, because Muhammad was trying to quell the Christian movement when he led his armies against uh, Serbia and Iraq and Iran. He was that whole Middle Eastern area was taken was, over within 600 years of, of his death. Muhammad was simply delivering the clear, clear communication. If you read, I have, but, but I have again, another, it's, it's another book I wrote. Christianity spread by the word. It's another People book. were not coerced into following. Yeah, they were. Emperor Constantine. Yeah, Emperor Constantine him, made it legal. He didn't make it required. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the Roman Empire had demonized Christianity for a couple hundred years, and then after after three hundred years, it was made sacrosanct. Power, he made Christianity legal. Right, it was made sacrosanct after his conversion. Well, you can learn, yeah. right? So the thing is, you know, we read in the Quran. If you read, I, I have another book written, and I deal with this very subject: the nature and personality of Muhammad. Not what these. Uh, tradition following Muslims say, but when we actually read the Quran, it's very clear that Muhammad was a kind man, a soft man, a shy man, and the only per uh, prerogative that he had, the only authority was to communicate the message. So what these so-called Muslims did after that, spreading by the sword and all, it has nothing to do with the Quran and the original message. That's another person, another group of people I'm in protest against. These mainstream Sunni mosques and Shia mosques, I don't follow any, they, they do not follow the Quran. They then, follow an idolatrous Then religion. how do you how do you try and claim that you have you alone have the truth? Not me alone. There's a few group of people. Those it's, who follow the word of God alone you've and not about the traditions as much credibility of men. As, as a Mormon saying that Joseph Smith had saw an angel and received this book of Mormon. I come the, with the credibility that God has given to his word. That's it. When these people including the Catholic God's Church word, the follow, Bible is older. Fo follow tradition. It comes with credibility of history. Fo follow tradition. Not when men really. Speak. What was that? Not really. When, the, when they follow upon, including the mosques as well, this was the historical mission of Muhammad, this was the historical mission of Jesus. When the mainstream religions start to follow the vain traditions of men, that's in the gospel, that's when deviation begins. And I am in protest to that very thing. The vain traditions of men that contradict the word of God, which is what Jesus was warring against. Yeah, and we're, we're, that's what the Protestants did in the 15th, 16th century. Sadly, the they religion. weren't able to fully break away. They kept the foolish yeah. doctrines like the Trinity and yeah, whatnot. Right. We got a different perspective there. Right? I appreciate the civil conversation. Yeah, for sure. May Take the care. Lord. Peace and blessings in the name of the Most High, viewer. My name is Walid Naim, and I am a zealous submitter to the one true God, the creator of all mankind. Do you notice something wrong with the world? Something strange? Despite us having a church, synagogue, and mosque in every neighborhood, how has this entire Western civilization fallen into abject atheism, nihilism, and savagery? Why does life just seem so dull, so meaningless, and so devoid of anything real in the Occidental world? 
Despite the ubiquitous presence of these religious institutions, why are our so-called Muslim sons in large numbers drinking, smoking, partying, and chasing after women with no seeming desire to do anything more with their life other than satisfy their base pleasures when God has commanded them to be clean, righteous, and responsible leaders of their community? And why are our hijabi so-called Muslim daughters walking around with tight jeans that reveal their figure with TikTok accounts posting semi-provocative, self-absorbed videos of themselves online for the world to see when God has commanded them to lengthen their garments and be modest in their mannerisms? What has happened here? These young men and women are supposed to be making themselves right before God while raising the next generation of ardent defenders of the holy faith. But it seems that Islam features no more in their lives other than a scarf on their head, a Friday fidgeting around in the mosque when their parents forced them to go against their will, or a decorative hanger in their car. At this rate, if God allows us to continue going down the road it is, then Islam and the Quran will become pretty much non-existent in the lives of most of our descendants, if it wasn't already non-existent now. If we do not take a stand soon... In a few generations, our children's children will likely be indistinguishable from the secular West. Is that the kind of world we want to live in? Our kids to live in? A world practically devoid of the remembrance of the one God and all things sane? I obviously can't speak for you, but for my own self, I can personally say, count me out of it. I'm not going to sit here and just watch my brothers and sisters, those who claim to believe in God alone, believe in Judgment Day, His prophets and angels, and all the other aspects of this holy creed get duped into going to hell. I'm not going to let this happen without at least something of an effort on my end to reroute this dark trajectory. So, again, how in the world do we end up here? There is a mosque in practically every neighborhood in the West, and no shortage of donations that get dropped in their boxes. They have had lots of funding, lots of time, and unquestioning support from their respective congregations, yet somehow have been run over by the secular atheist. All of their so-called Muslim children go to the atheist, secular public schools for most of their week to be taught beliefs that are completely incompatible with the Qur'an. And we wonder why they have ended up the way they are. If these houses, and by these houses I mean the mosques, were truly of God that were doing everything right, then why would our Lord let them get so decisively trampled upon by their enemies? Why do the wicked have all of the reins of power here? Clearly, something is not adding up. Well, it is my thesis here today that the vast, vast majority of mosques that exist in this world today have lost their way and follow a religion which is completely foreign to the Qur'an. This is why they have failed so miserably in the West, and it seems that God has forgotten them. In truth, the real reason behind their shortcoming is that they, and many of us, have forgotten God himself, which is why he has left us here collecting our bitter receipts. So, what are my exact criticisms of the mosques today? As a Muslim, and a man committed to the truth above all else, what are my personal gripes with their institution, which claims to be for God? The first glaring problem I can think of is that the majority of people who call themselves Muslim have allied themselves with a body of literature that is foreign to the Word of God, treating it equal to and in fact above the Qur'an itself. Of course, I am talking about the Hadith. Listen, the facts are this. There is no justification within the Qur'an which tells us to follow this Hadith stuff, which came hundreds of years after the Prophet Muhammad died, and therefore he could have had no ability to oversee what people have said about him, and determine if it is true or false. It is now becoming crystal clear, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, that many, many things that have been ascribed to him in their most quote-unquote authoritative texts, which they call their Sahih Hadiths, are forgeries that directly contradict God's final revelation. To take these words of men, i.e. the Hadith, and hold them to be equally authoritative to the words of God would be breaking the first and most important commandment, which is to worship God alone, making no equals with him. To say that these supposed words of Muhammad, which are not even Muhammad's own words, but simply very doubtful rumors about what people who existed hundreds of years after him say he said, that have been decided upon by the scholars as authoritative holds equal or in fact any way in our faith comparable to the verbatim words of God himself, the Holy Quran, is idolatry. You are exalting man's words to the status of divinity, which should only be given to God's words. Nothing comes even close to the Quran because God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is its author. 
This includes the Hadith too, which pales in comparison and is superfluous to the glorious Qur'an. If you are interested in seeing a full refutation of the Hadith, you may watch my video titled, A Defense of Prophet Muhammad, David Wood and Hadith Exposed, which is linked below. In it, along with refuting and putting in his place the worst opponent of Islam on the internet, Mr. David Wood, I also expose how the Hadith is completely contradictory to the Qur'an and the source of much of the Muslim world's problems. It is a two-hour long documentary where I seek to demonstrate the true character of Muhammad in the Qur'an, defending his history and personality with primary source quotations. I clear the last prophet of God's name from the people who have tarnished his reputation the most, which are certain types of Christians, and, sad to say, hadith-following Muslims, which have said many terrible things about him. No, Muhammad was not a money-hungry, tyrannical warlord who married a six-year-old girl. He was a shy, humble, meek man who married adult women, had compassion for even his worst enemies, and oftentimes had a tough time even standing up for himself out of fear of hurting other people's feelings. This is all demonstrated in detail in my video. Once again, the link for that will be in the description under the tab, The True Character of Muhammad in the Qur'an. So that is the first problem with the mosques, the reason for which I feel they have been forsaken by God, their adoption of an apostate literature which contradicts their foundational scripture. The second point of contention I have with many of the mosques is their seeming unwillingness to say anything controversial which may make them face persecution from their government. The fact that 9-11 was not only an inside job, but the fact that no planes hit the Twin Towers on that day, and the whole charade was a hoax designed by the governments of the world to forever frame the Muslim people as terrorists and justify invasions in our countries, should be taught to every man, woman, and child. This great fraud of the September attacks has left such a lasting, enduring reputation on every brown person, and Muslim in general, that it should be discussed in every mosque. Our people are not responsible for that crime, but it was the governments of the world who carried out that plot and framed us for it. 9-11 is just only one small example, though. There are many, many other quote-unquote conspiracy theories, which are really just conspiracy facts, avoided by the mosques due to their controversy, like the fact that the monetary system in the West is an ungodly scam based on usury, the fact that the so-called healthcare system is a predatory empire which doesn't try to cure anybody but instead makes money off of human suffering, the fact that sodomite propaganda is being promoted to the masses, including our children, and the fact that the thing which I will call the C-1-9-er, to avoid censorship, was a hoax perpetrated by the powers that be to greatly expand their police state, censorship incentives, and surveillance systems worldwide in order to create their new world order, and much more. These governments that have occupied our lands are de facto terrorist regimes, and the mosques seem to say nothing of it. They appear to be more concerned with not being labeled extremists while they live their comfortable, well-funded lives, avoiding topics that are hard to deal with due to the abject persecution they bring. That is my second problem with them. They're at the very least lack of awareness, or if not, perhaps lack of willingness to address the real geopolitical situation going on in the world. And lastly, my third trouble with the mainstream mosques, which can also be put into the category of conspiracy facts, is their complete ignorance on the true nature of the earth. It may sound as a shock to you, my viewer, that the Qur'an, the Bible, and in fact all of the ancient scriptures teach the earth is flat and stationary. This is the only model of the world which is compatible with those texts, and also scientifically provable. This flat earth conspiracy, which should really be called the globe earth conspiracy, is one of the biggest lies of the modern world we are told, and goes in line with what I said earlier about the endemic corruption of the governments of the world. Everything you have been told about where you live is a fabrication, and the space agencies are a shameless hoax. For a fully detailed presentation on the subject of flat earth, where I demonstrate the science, the history, the philosophy, the verses in the Bible and Quran proving it, and much more, you can read my book titled The Flat Earth Manifesto, which is linked in the description. This work runs to nearly 1,200 pages and is practically a textbook on not only the topic of flat earth, but the subject of physics proper, and I expose the biggest fraudulent religion of the West, which is science worship, otherwise known as scientism. As with all of my work, it too is available for free. 
No, you do not live on a pathetic speck of dust spinning around in the middle of nowhere in space. You live in a brilliant, intelligently designed terrarium created by God and are at the center of the universe. Again, to learn more, the link to the Flat Earth Manifesto will be in the description. Those right there are my three biggest scores against the mosques of today. There are more points I could bring up, but these are the major ones. These are the controversies which have estranged me from the rest of the so-called Muslim world. Believe me when I say that I would love to join them and that it hurts me so deeply that I have to pit myself up against the very institution I was born and raised in, the mosques I attended from childhood whose carpets upon which I walked, stood, prayed, and listened to the preaching in my earliest years. But that is the price to pay for the truth. My commitment to God and what is right is more important than my emotional attachments to a place that was once dear to my heart. Simply put, this is why I think God has forsaken us. This is why I think that the mosques have been steamrolled by the secular atheist. It is because most of us have abandoned the word of God, neglected preaching the truth, and instead chosen comfort over courageous action. That is my thesis to why this great falling away in the West has taken place. If this sounds shocking to you, if it sounds so unbelievable that the majority of the so-called Muslim world could be deceived so badly, then I simply have these verses in the Quran to show you. In the name of God, the Almighty and the Merciful. Chapter 6, verse 116. And if thou obey most of those upon the earth, they will lead thee astray from the path of God. They follow only assumption, and they are only guessing. Chapter 25, verse 30. And the messenger will say, Oh my Lord, my people took this Qur'an as a thing abandoned. God has really predicted this a millennia ago. He knew that the people who follow what is really right are few and far between, that the majority of men and women are led astray, and the people who claim to love Muhammad the most, i.e. mainstream Muslims, would abandon the glorious Qur'an. God has revealed to us a thousand years ago that this all would be the case. It is my mission, therefore, by the will of God, to band together with like-minded believers who have understood the truth and work together to build a new institution from the ground up, founded upon prudent fear. We need to start fresh, start anew. We need to build a new mosque where people can hear the unfiltered preaching from the Quran alone, where men and women can get married, where children can play and be educated in the truth, and where the name of the Most High God, without any associate partners, can be remembered. We need a group of highly dedicated men who will raise and defend this institution with their own hands if need be and go out into the world warning people of the punishment of God, bearing witness to the truth of his oneness. That is my mission, my viewer. If you found that this mission of mine has touched your heart and is something you want to get involved with, then feel free to contact me in the email below. I am located in Ontario, Canada, and I'm looking forward to form a community with like-minded believers who want to contribute to this great cause. I am neither a nationalist nor racially biased. If you follow the Qur'an alone and believe in the truth, then as far as I'm concerned, you are my brother in the faith. I prefer you over someone of my own kindred who denies God and commits corruption in the earth. My loyalties are primarily ideological, not racial. Remember, my viewer, that this life is short. Everything we do and don't do is recorded by God and will either bear witness for us or against us on the Day of Judgment. Hell is eternal, and I do not know about you, but as for me, I want to meet my creator in the best state possible. I want to spend my life struggling to build up my people, the true Muslims, so that God may be pleased with me on that day. If you are interested in that, then feel free to join me. If not, then find something else good to do which will prepare you for your appointment with the Most High. That is where we are all going anyway. With that being said, I say peace and God bless to all of you good people. Take care, everyone.